in the last 10 years, there's been sort of a rapid embrace of comic culture and comic books and graphic novels. I think these things have moved very quickly to the center of the culture. The marketplace is much deeper and much wider. I am Jonathan Gray. I am an assistant professor of English at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. I get to teach a class, a very popular class, on graphic novels. Graphic novels are a medium, and inside that medium, you can tell many different kinds of stories. There are certainly some stories that are for kids, um, but you know, much of it is not, and we should treat that work with the seriousness that it deserves. Something like, you know, Mouse, uh, Joe Sacco's Palestine, um, the Hernandez Brothers' uh, Love and Rockets, um, Kyle Baker's Nat Turner. These are serious attempts to grapple with important historical issues. They um, are engaging in a sophisticated kind of storytelling. My class uh, opens with superhero comics, in part because in 1986, 86 is a watershed year for comics, and the three things that make it a watershed year are Mouse, but also Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns. I can't do the class justice without at least touching on these, you know, culturally incredibly important comics, um, and two of them happen to be superhero comics. Then when we start getting into Chris Ware and Charles Burns, people who are more obscure um, to, to, a, to a mainstream audience, they've sort of already been taught how to properly, you know, sort of take apart a comic through the sort of comfort of the superhero comics. These are billion dollar archetypes, right? And so we should, we should begin to understand why um, they have such a hold on our culture. Comic-Con is sometimes called nerd prom. What it really is, is, is it's that things that were marginal or were perceived as marginal 15 years ago are now at the center of American culture and global culture. If you know obscure facts about the New York Yankees, then you're great. You know, you're a fan of the Yankees and you know obscure facts and that's somehow completely fine. But if you know obscure facts about Wolverine, what's wrong with you, right? And so Comic-Con has blown up as people have learned that, well, you know what? This is a multi-billion dollar industry across many, many different platforms. And so now it's, it's getting, you know, mass media attention. It's getting critical attention in the Academy. You have cutting edge, avant-garde, wonderful, and wonderfully creative work, and then you have mass, crass work. As an academic, I'm never going to um, say, oh, this Avengers movie is amazing, you should watch it, right? Um, but I would say Persepolis, the graphic novel, and Persepolis, the Academy Award-nominated film, are both worthy of intellectual scrutiny. I was lucky to sort of come along at a time when mainstream comics were sort of reaching a, a you know a height of quality. I was lucky enough to you know pick up Watchmen as individual issues as it was coming out. I was reading Frank Miller's Daredevil. I was reading Alan Moore's Swamp Thing, and these are some of the some of the, of, of the highest praised comics of all time. I think what's happening now is that there's a tremendous amount of diversity. Chris Ware, for example, who people compare to James Joyce. He just released a new collection of stories, and it's, it's incredible, right? Um, I mean, he's, and he's being reviewed in the New York Times Book Review. There's also like three new Avengers comic books out there on the market now to take advantage of the fact that this movie has sort of created a, a, an audience for the Avengers that maybe wasn't there before. I treat comics the same way. Some of them are obscure and they're great. Some of them are more popular and also great, right? And so, you know, there's something of value. There's some critical value to all of it.